Okay. And uh, um, okay, so I think we can start. So, Lock you, will you mind to, you are the host, and would you mind to uh, uh, give a short introduction to our speaker today? Sure, um, my pleasure. Yeah. So, good evening, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the PAP uh, research seminar. So, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Chiam Keng Hui. Dr. Chiam is a longtime friend of mine, and um, in fact, we have uh, work closely in some project before, especially on cellular uh, oxidation. So um, first I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Chiam. So Dr. Chiam is a theorist working at the interface of physics and biology. Um, he actually worked closely also with experimental groups uh, in developing models for many of the bi biological phenomena. He, explored um, his expertise, especially is in mechanical biology, biological physics, and system biology. Um, he is currently a um, senior principal investigator at ASTAR, the Bioinformatics Institute of ASTAR. Dr. Chiam received his PhD in physics from the California Institute of Technology. Yeah, and he actively researched uh, in many interesting areas. And especially, um, I think today uh, we are waiting a very interesting presentation by him on the biophysical modeling of cell migration. So without further ado, let us uh, welcome Dr. Chiam to present on his uh, uh, research work. Yeah. Can we? Yeah. Okay. Uh, all, uh, for you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lok Yu and David for the introduction. So let me just share my screen. Can everyone see the slides? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, so yeah. Thank you all for attending. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about some of our recent efforts in uh, in uh, the modeling of our cell migration. Uh, so I understand that uh, many of you may not be very familiar with uh, the biology or the biological aspects. Uh, of this research. Uh, so, you know, try to go slowly. Uh, and if there's any questions, uh, please feel free to, uh, you know, speak up and, and, and I'll try to answer them along the way. Yeah, so before I go into the talk proper, uh, I would like to maybe you know, go back to Physics 101, something that uh, maybe everyone is familiar with, uh, which is, uh, you know, how, how do we walk? And maybe we teach this in, you know, Newtonian physics, Newtonian mechanics, uh, uh, but it's actually not that straightforward. I will really think carefully about, about it. Uh, so in order that we can walk, the muscles in our leg, in our knee, for example, have to contract. Uh, and this contraction of the you know, muscles uh, essentially converts uh, chemical energy into mechanical energy. Right? And then uh, that's not sufficient. Right? This, this, this momentum has then to be transferred to the environment. Right? So we walk on the earth, and then by Newton's third law, the earth pushes back on us, uh, allowing us to move forward. Then uh, you know, we can ask then you know, uh, you know, interesting questions, uh, which is uh, how do other species move? Uh, so one of the joy of working in biology, uh, to me personally, uh, is this diversity of organisms. Uh, so what I show here is uh, you know, what people call the phylogenetic tree. You know, it's like the tree of life. Uh, uh, which you, know, you can roughly classify into three big categories: uh, you know, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. Uh, you know, so you know, you know, we, we think that humans dominate this planet, uh, you know, the world. But you know, humans is only a, a very small branch in this big tree of life. Uh, there's a very, a very ancient bacteria species uh, that has been around for millions of years. Right? How do they move? Right? There's plants. Uh, there's ciliates. There's slime molds. Uh, they all have very different mechanisms of moving. So I'll, I'll spend the next, uh, you know, five to ten minutes, uh, sort of like just giving a survey about about this, uh, how how these different species move. So this is not really research per se, but you know, I think it's just a nice, uh, you know, illustration of the diversity that's available in biology, you know, and what can we learn about it. So I like to start with a very, uh, very ancient species are called cyanobacteria. Uh, so if you go to, I don't know, Sentosa Beach or the East Coast Park during the intertidal 
regions, uh, you can sometimes uh, you know, see blooms of this, this uh, cyanobacteria, this algae. So they're very ancient in the sense that uh, they don't have any organelles or appendages. So, so they, are, they are just uh, you know, essentially uh, filaments right, that assemble together to form even longer filaments. Right? So they're, 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 there's nothing about them. So the question is, how do they, how do they move? And it turns out that they actually evolve a very interesting uh, mechanism where they actually expel or secrete uh, slime or some kind of a polysaccharide, uh, polysaccharide substance. Uh, so this is a little bit like you know these rocket ships are you know ejecting this about this uh, you know, burst of air to move themselves forward. Uh, yeah, so you know very ancient species uh, have developed this uh, mechanism. Also, then the other interesting question to ask is uh, why do these cyanobacteria, why do these algae move? Well, the reason they move is that uh, this is actually one of the earliest organisms that are. Uh, that, uh, that converts our sunlight into energy. So they need to move towards uh, sources of uh, sunlight, uh, sources of light, or uh, what, what technically people call phototaxis, you know, moving towards light. And they have evolved this mechanism to do so. So moving on, uh, you know, maybe later on, uh, you know, other, other species of bacteria evolve. Uh, and a very common bacteria that every biologist studies is uh, E. coli, you know, one of these intestinal bacteria. So this bacteria has uh, essentially a flagella, essentially a, a helical tail, a corkscrew, a corkscrew tail. And uh, you can see, I hope you can all see the video running here. Yeah. So you can, so this is actually an image of a bacteria with this corkscrew tail, or this helical tail. And then the, the helical tail rotates. And it is this rotation of this helical tail that actually causes it to, uh, to move or to, to, to swim in, 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 in water. In, in a fluid environment, right? and the mechanism or the the, the, the energy here is that uh, is uh, there's there's a there's a proton gradient, there's a proton pump involved in the in causing the flagella to to rotate. So the flagella, uh, uh, this bacteria swims through an environment, you know, makes use of this great this proton pump to to you know cause a mechanical movement. Yeah, so now we move on to something that's uh, maybe a little bit more evolved, uh, a little bit more re uh, more recent. So this is uh, a paramecium. Uh, you know, it's an organism that if you go to a pond or you know some lake, you can actually pick it up. So it's, a, it's uh, one of the earliest uh, uh, unicellular organic uh, eukaryotes uh, around. Uh, so this particular example is is uh, is, is is paramecium. And what is interesting is that it actually evolved uh, essentially this, this bundle of hair all, all, all on the surface of its body. Uh, so technically, we call them cilia, but they are just, they are just hair. And uh, what is actually very interesting is that uh, this cilia actually uh, beat, like move in a very synchronized manner, uh, what we call a metachrony, uh, to produce uh, metachronal waves uh, you know, which actually drives this uh, whole cell body forward. So this is an experiment done by a collaborator in Japan, uh, which is sort of the reverse of that. So in this case, uh, the pipette tip holds the organism, holds the cell fixed in place. Uh, and then you can see that uh, the movement of this, uh, of this uh, ciliary, ciliary array uh, causes the fluid to flow around it. So this is uh, so the dots here you see essentially uh, ink particle in that we just drop into the water, right? And you can see this stripping motion. So we have also developed numerical simulations of this process, uh, and I think this is actually a very interesting physics problem of our uh, synchronization. Right? If you have an array of uh, you know beating elastic filaments, right? how how do you synchronize them to produce essentially this wave-like motion? Uh, so I'll not go into detail in, in this today, uh, but I think uh, this is, I think, an example of how, uh, you know, physics and biology can work together. So now moving on to something that's, uh, you know, maybe even more relevant, uh, amoeba cells. Uh, so this particular example here is a dictocelium, it's a, it's a slime mold. Uh, so this is a rather old video, which are uh, essentially a, a pipette containing some food and you can see this individual amoeba moving towards the food. And, and, and what is interesting is that uh, the mechanism of this motion is essentially by shape changes. So this, this, uh, this dictocelium, this single amoeba cell, moves by changing its shape. Uh, 
So this is interesting because now we go on the human cells. Uh, so this is actually a video that I like very much uh, and it's actually taken in the 1950s, uh, I think before everyone in this audience you know, was born. Uh, so this is actually a human white blood cell, the neutrophil. Uh, you can ignore these round cells here, these are the red blood cells. So this is actually, uh, if I start the video again, so this is actually a white blood cell chasing and chasing a prey and external bacteria because the function of white blood cells is to chase down infection and try to you know, prevent, you know, try to eat up all the, all the infection. And again, you can see that as this, as this white blood cell moves, it forms all these uh, protrusions, right? So again, uh, you know, this is, this is uh, so, so the difference between you know, this uh, human cell and the previous example of an amoeba is that uh, you know, they're separated by, you know, I don't know how many millions years of evolution, right? So, and, and yet uh, they seem to have this uh, you know, very common mechanism, right? So this suggests that there's some uh, universality to this mechanism. And as physicists, uh, you know, we want to understand you know, what are these, uh, what are, what are, you know, what are these universal or are there even any universal mechanisms for motility, for movement by shape changes, right? And this is essentially the, the motivation for, for, for my research to try to work out some you know, physical principle for motion by shape changes. Uh, now then, of course, uh, you know, we have to convince people why, you know, why doing things like this, uh, why, why, why doing research like this is important. And it turns out that uh, maybe in the last 10, 20 years, uh, people have found that our cancer cells are actually undergo a very similar type of uh, shape change uh, during uh, metastasis. So uh, I'll just give a very, very preliminary introduction to cancer and metastasis. So if one is to unfortunately develop a cancer, uh, very often what kills a person is not a cancer, but it's what is called metastasis. And what that means is as follows. So very often uh, cells from a primary tumor, so this is a schematic cartoon of a tumor, a tumor mass, right? So, so, so a tumor is just a, Right. So cancer is essentially, uh, you know, cells uh, that have sort of gone crazy and then proliferate, you know, in an uncontrolled manner. So you get a tumor mass. So once in a while, some of these tumor cells, some of these cancer cells will actually uh, detach from the primary tumor and then migrate through the tissue in the body until ultimately it finds the bloodstream and then it travels into the bloodstream and as it gets carried away you know, into a distant part of the body, right? So for example, this may be a tumor of the lung and then it gets carried to, a, let's say, the liver or a kidney, right? And, and it, it seeds a secondary tumor in the, in the cancer, right? So this whole process of uh, spreading is, uh, you know, what people call metastasis. Right? And this metastasis is very deadly because, you know, you know one may go to a doctor and then you know, may be cured of, uh, you know, through... I don't know, uh, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, one may be cured of the primary tumor, right? But then it is very difficult to detect these uh, secondary tumors that are seeded by metastasis. Right? So we hope to understand the mechanisms for this, uh, for this uh, migration of these cancer cells during, you know, during, this, uh, during this process. Uh, so this, what I show on the right here is a scanning electron microscope of a cancer cell that's migrating through the tissue. So the blue color filaments are essentially the, the collagen network, right? So the, the, the tissue in the body is made up of this uh, very dense network of collagens. And essentially the cancer cell has to squeeze through this dense network. And uh, you can see that it does that by forming all these protrusions. So it has this very wrinkled surface, uh, right? but it's, it's actively trying to change its shape to you know, maybe squeeze through all these pores in this uh, collagen network. To, 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 to try to invade through this, through this tissue. Right? So, so, so again, this process is very reminiscent of what I showed previously for the neutrophils and the amoeba. You know, again, suggesting that uh, there's some universality to this uh, cell shape change. Right? So now this is going into you know, slightly more details. Uh, so if you look at the bottom panel here, so this is the bottom panel is a, is a time series uh, of a single cell undergoing this shape change. So, so initially the cell has a small protrusion, right? And then this protrusion grows, you know, bigger and bigger, 
right? And then the arrow points to a fiducial marker. It's just a, it's just a, some, some dot, some organelle in the cytoplasm that seems to flow into this, right? suggesting uh, that there's some cytoplasmic flow that is responsible for this uh, shape change. Now, what is actually very common is that uh, the cell does not just form only one of these protrusions. Uh, sometimes it can form multiple you know, protrusions, you know, such as like this a uh, pretty, pretty picture here. So, you know, we want to understand and we want to develop essentially a physical model for this process. Uh, and so let me now go into slightly more details. Uh, so technically, we name one of these protrusions uh, a blap. Right? I, I, I don't know who came up with this name, uh, but you know, it's just a cute little name. Right? So one, one of these uh, protrusions is, is what people call a blap. Right? And then uh, essentially, there are, there are, or we think that uh, in order for this blap to form or you know, this shape change to occur, uh, there are essentially three essential components in this. Uh, so one is the cell membrane. Which is actually the outer outermost layer of the cell, which I denote by blue color here. So it's the outer layer of the shell, right? and then of, of the cell. And then uh, the second component is uh, you know some underlying cytoskeleton that holds the cell together. Uh, so we typically call that the the ectomyosin cortex or just the cortex, which I denote by the red color here. So you can think of the blue color as essentially the the, the outermost layer of the cell that is deformable. And then the red color, the cortex is kind of the, the structure, the structure of the cell, which is not that deformable. Uh, and then there are all these adhesion, adhesion proteins that link them together, which I illustrate by this uh, purple straight lines here. Right. So under homogeneous, homos, homeostatic or uh, homogeneous conditions, uh, you know, the, the cortex and the adhesion holds the cell together. Right, so the cell is typically rounded off, you know, in a very homogeneous manner. Uh, but once in a while, you know, some of these uh, adhesions may may weaken, you know, for for whatever reason, right? Or there could be some uh, localized pulses of uh, pressure. Uh, when I say pressure, I really mean hydrostatic pressure within the cell uh, that that causes that pushes the the, the cell membrane outwards. Right. And then if the pressure is sufficiently strong or if the adhesion is sufficiently weak, then this bond becomes, becomes uh, broken. Right? And then now there's nothing to hold this part of the membrane back. So the membrane then actually protrudes outwards. Right? And then eventually after some time, uh, the cortex uh, reforms after, the, after the, this protrusion. Right? And then the rear retracts and you get a new and you go back to equilibrium again. But the difference between this final shape and the initial shape is that uh, there is now a translation, there is now a movement. Right? So this we think is, you know, in some sense, a physicist's view of, uh, of uh, how blabbing or how the formation of a, of a protrusion uh, leads, to, leads, to, leads to motion. Yeah, so this is the only slide with our equations that I will show. And this is essentially a, you know, taking a physics approach to try to understand to understand this problem. So the, the key question that we want to answer here is uh, what is the size and the shape of these blebs? Uh, is there universality to the size and the shape of these protrusions or not? So we model that using a very simple uh, one-dimensional membrane. Right? So instead of uh, looking at this rounded part, I now just you know, look at, let's say, a small segment. Right? And then I assume that it is a straight line. Right? So my x-axis my x -axis will be essentially this, uh, this, this uh, this, uh, this, this, uh, this, 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 this length, uh, essentially a piece of this membrane, right? And then the variable that I'm interested in is uh, what I call the, the, the y of x, which is just the height of this height of this membrane, right? And then uh, I assume that now this membrane has uh, essentially energetics, right? So if I look at the energy per unit length of this membrane, I can you know just essentially write down some simple terms here. Right, so there's a term corresponding to the bending right, because this membrane bends and this bending costs energy. Uh, now for cell membranes, uh, the bending energy is actually very well studied. Uh, uh, people have calculated you know, the bending rigidity for, for cell membranes are uh, you know, pretty, pretty carefully. Right? And then there's an in-plane tension. And then the third term is essentially the elastic energy of the bonds. 
And then there's a term here corresponding to the pressure, the hydrostatic pressure from the cell pushing on this membrane. Uh, and then that, that's, a, that's actually an adhesion term that binds this together. Right? So I write down an energy per unit length. And then I can essentially write down the corresponding Euler-Lagrange equation. So this is the Euler-Lagrange equation. So I assume that uh, the pressure has a very specific form. Uh, so it's just a Gaussian pulse. Uh, and so it's just a, a localized pulse with a uh, width uh, xp and a magnitude p. Uh, but what is interesting here is that now I have to supplement this uh, PDE by boundary conditions. Right? And the boundary condition is essentially what you know, people in uh, soft condensed method do all the time, uh, which is actually a contact line problem. Right. So the left and the right side of this uh, of the boundary of the boundary can actually can actually move uh, at a with a certain uh, viscosity uh, by balancing the the energy. Right. So I have uh, now I write out the energy. I have a corresponding Euler Lagrange equation at the boundary conditions, and I can simply solve this uh, in a rather straightforward manner. And we find that you can actually get, uh, in some cases, you can get equilibrium, equilibrium shapes uh, that, are, that are stable. So there are two in, the two interesting parameters here are on the x-axis P, uh, which is essentially the magnitude of the pressure. So this is how, how strong you are pushing out on the membrane. Right? And then the second important parameter, what I call XP on the y-axis, is actually the width of this, of this pulse. Right? So how how localized or how wide the pulse is. Right? And we can essentially work out a regime where you form these blebs and then regimes where you don't form this, you, form, you, don't, you don't form these blebs. Right? So these are just some representative shapes and sizes of these blebs. Uh, so if I compare these three shapes, uh, you, know, you can see a very small bleb when the pressure is low, you get a bigger bleb when the pressure is high. Right? And then uh, when the pulse is broad, you can also get a bigger, you can also get a bigger bleb. Right, and we think that there's some universality to this. Right? And then there's a, there's a threshold at which below which you don't get a, you don't get a blood formation. Right? So we can more or less uh, work out some universal you know, shape and size of this, uh, of these protrusions. Uh, now very often uh, these blebs uh, have some asymmetry in, for example, the, the reforming and the contraction. Right? So these blebs actually do travel. Right, and we do that by essentially assuming that uh, the boundary condition. So we allow there to be some, to be some, to be some traveling, right? Uh, and this, 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 this velocity of this healing is, is you can think of it as essentially a left-right asymmetry. Uh, but additionally, we can also assume that the pressure pulse is actually is actually non-static. So the the the, the pulse can actually move around, uh, which we denote by just a simple linear term here. For now, yeah. So when we do this, we find that uh, you know, in certain regimes, the the blood can travel, whereas in other regimes, uh, you know, you you can, we get what we call extinction. That means the blebs cannot be be sustained. Uh, so what this shows is that uh, you know, essentially you cannot travel faster than you know, than you can you can heal. There has to be some comparable comparable uh, you know, speeds between the pressure pulse and the and the and the healing. So we have this nice uh, mathematical framework set up. Then now we need to put it to good use. Uh, right. so, so, so now I can have a cell which I solve for this uh, dynamics correctly. And then in this case, uh, I have all these traveling protrusions. So in this case, this is just an example of a cell which forms uh, random protrusions, uh, which forms these random blebs. Right. And then we, right, then, so we just set it up so that the so the only thing that we put in by hand is that the formation of these blebs, the location where they form is random, right? but then everything else is then governed by what we think is the correct physics, as I just described previously. So what we found is that we can get these uh, shapes of these cells, right? uh, and then as the as the blebs form, the center of mass of the cell change, uh, which I denote by this trajectory here, and you can see that uh, it almost. Uh, I mean, we didn't do the statistics properly, but uh, you know, it looks like a, a, a random walk, right? So it's, it's, so it's, it's undergoing a random walk. And uh, now then the other thing in biology, as I think in physics, is that uh, you have a model, nice, but then you've got to compare it with experiments. 
so this is actually an old experiment uh, done in some developmental biology system where they show single cells are uh, forming these blebs and they're moving around randomly also. Right. So we think that uh, we have something that looks uh, pretty, you know, like what is happening in the real, you know, for, for, for real cells. So then what we are interested in is what we call directed migration. So as the examples that I showed previously, uh, you know, the cells are not just randomly migrating, right? They, they go towards where the food is or they go towards where the light is. Uh, so then the question is, uh, we need therefore some directional sensing and what we call polarization. Uh, so then we, we essentially put in uh, essentially a feedback mechanism. So it's actually a negative integral feedback loop, right? Where you know, if the cells are, if the blebs are in a more desired direction, right, then they, they will form more quickly and more frequently. Uh, yeah, so this is an example so of what we're trying to do here. So the cell starts at the top left corner of this video, right? And then the background color here shows essentially the, you can think of this as essentially the, the intensity of food or light that the cell is attracted to. So red is highest. So the cell should be attracted from a region of low food to high food. And we show that uh, in this mechanism of uh, forming this protrusions, forming this blebs, the cell can actually migrate towards this uh, source of food. Uh, but what is interesting is that when it reaches that, it actually stays there. It doesn't wander off, right? Uh, so I, I want to say that, uh, you know, this is, that there's almost no, Right. This is based on this physics mechanisms uh, that almost nothing is put in by, by hand here. Right. So in, in biology, uh, noise is very important. Uh, so the difference between this video and this video is that here I make the background or, or the, the, the attractant a lot noisier. So we can see that uh, now the cell is you know, still ultimately able to be attracted to the region of the highest food. Uh, but maybe it takes a longer, it takes a more tortuous path, you know, to, to reach there. So in biology, we call this, uh, you know, uh, robustness. Right? So, so, so the mechanism must be robust. Uh, this is actually quite interesting uh, because now you can think of this. Uh, so, so the key idea here is that there's some uh, negative feedback loop. Uh, right? So how, how does a negative feedback loop uh, you know, reduce, reduce noise to achieve this robustness? So that, that I think would be a very interesting physics problem to look at also. Now then once we have gotten this to work, uh, you know, we can torture the cell, right? You can have, uh, you, can, you can let the cell choose between, uh, you know, good food and, you know, better food, right? A higher concentration or high intensity and the cell maybe in this case uh, you know, chooses the higher, higher density. So we, so we can, we can, uh, so we can therefore now you know think of this essentially as a as an optimization problem now, right? So the cell needs to migrate to a target to find food, and we can have very complex landscapes and we can have very complex noise. So so we think we have a good model, right? We have a good system of what is going on now. Uh, of course, then the question is how do we test this experimentally? So there's actually a very nice uh, experimental setup that unfortunately. Uh, you know, I as a physicist cannot do because it's quite sophisticated biology. Uh, so this is a group in Harvard, uh, Tim Mitchison. So what they do is that they actually have a zebra fish. So this is a real fish. And then they actually cut the tail of the fish to essentially create an injury. So this injury then releases uh, some, you know, compounds, in this case, hydrogen peroxide. And then the white blood cells sense this hydrogen peroxide and then move to this region of our, uh, you know, injury to try to repair the system. So this, at that time, this was, I think, a tour de force experimental. It's a very beautiful experiment. And so they genetically engineer a system where they can fluorescently visualize the, the hydrogen peroxide. So this is where they cut the tail of the fish. Uh, and you can see very high concentrations. And then ultimately, you see eventually the neutrophils all migrate towards, uh, towards, this, towards this region. Uh, of high injury, and you can see as this as these white blood cells move, you know, it forms all these protrusions, just like what I what I showed before. Right. So, so you know, I would have loved to collaborate with uh, you know people in Singapore working on zebrafish to see whether we can do something like this. 
uh, but this turns out to be uh, you know too too biologically difficult. So we try to do something simpler and more relevant to the cancer case. Uh, so if you recall, I said earlier about this cancer metastasis. Right? So cancer cells can actually squeeze through the extracellular matrix. Right? So this, this fibrous network uh, in, the, in the body and you know, form these protrusions right, to, to squeeze through this network. So we did a very simple, or we set up a very simple system uh, which is to confine a cell between essentially two pieces of gel, right? To mimic this uh this 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 three D environment. So we're we're literally confining. I mean, this is actually a rather simple experimental setup. So we are confining a cell between two pieces of substrate, just just two two barriers, right? And then looking at how the cell squeezes through squeezes through this uh this 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 barrier. Right? As a, as a very simple in vitro model. For how cancer cells are squeezed through, squeezed through, uh, you know the, the the tissue. So when we set this up, uh, I mean this is actually rather technically challenging, uh, because you know, we have to ensure that the, the the cells survive and are viable because you have to flow in nutrients. Uh, but you know it took us a while, but we got this set up, and we found that uh the cells are happy, the cells can survive in this environment, and they form these uh protrusions. So, so we, we validated this system that the, the cells we use, the neutrophils can form blebs under this confinement. Uh, this is just a video. Uh, you don't have to look at the other channels. Maybe you look at this green one. Right? So you can see the cells form these blebs uh, that I've described previously, and then it, it, it migrates. So this is a, a cell that's been squished, that's been confined under this, uh, under this system. So what we think is happening here is that uh, is that as this cell is being squeezed by the by the by by the two pieces of gel, uh, it is essentially pushing on this on this uh, on this gel to anchor itself and then it migrates forward. So this is a little bit like uh, you know this people going rock climbing right, where they push on the on the on the rocks to propel themselves upwards, right? So we think uh, we call this chimneying. So we think that are uh, the mechanism for you know the cell transferring momentum in order to migrate uh, is this process of chimneying, right? But this requires us to confirm or to prove that uh, there are actually forces acting on the acted on. So the cell actually pushes and exerts forces perpendicular for onto the substrate. Uh, so this actually led us to think about how we can actually develop a system to actually measure the forces that the cells exert on the substrate. So we developed this system which we call 3D traction force microscopy that I'll try to explain uh, briefly now. Right, so we have a cell and then the cell is forming these protrusions or is trying to push onto the substrate. Right? Uh, so then what we have is that we have an elastic substrate. So this will be some polymer, some, some polymer that has a, that is rather soft, that is deformable. Right? And then inside this polymer, we embed some uh, fluorescent beads into it. So these are 100 nanometer fluorescent beads. Right? So as the cell pushes on, the, on this elastic gel, on this elastic substrate, right? the, because it is elastic, the beads will move Right, even at the distance from where the force is applied. Right? And then if we capture the before and after image of the beads, we can then back calculate the what we call the, the local strain tensor from the local displacements. Right? And then once we have the full 3D uh, strain field, the strain tensor field, we can then locally calculate the stress field. Right. This is just a simple uh, inverse problem. So we actually set up this system. So in this case, we use uh, two color beads. So yellow beads are you know, the gel at the top. Uh, red beads are the gel at the bottom. So the cell is actually squished inside here. You cannot see the cell. It, it, it's too small at this level. Right? So this is the X, Y, X, this is the X, X, Z, Y, Z, and X, Y plane. So this is looking from the top. This is looking from the, from the two sides. So you can see the cell is migrating here, and then uh, we can actually track the movement of the beads, right? And then from this, uh, from from then we can image it over time and capture it in three D, 
we can actually back calculate the force that the cell exerts. Right? So now I have a system where I can actually calculate the forces that the cells exert on this substrate. Right? And uh, what we found is that uh, if you look at, let's say, so these are two different cells. So if you look at, uh, so the color codes for the magnitude of the, of the force. Right? So this is the bottom gel, this is the top gel. And uh, you can see that as the cell moves, it exerts uh, vertical forces into the gel, suggesting that the cell is indeed uh, pushing on the top and bottom substrates as it moves itself forward. Uh, what is then more interesting is that we can now actually vary the gap of the cell. So I can have a very small gap, just a two micron gap. I have a bigger gap and an even bigger gap. And what we found is that the, uh, the, the force is actually strong when the gap is very small. Uh, which makes sense, uh, right? Because you, you have a, you're, you're squishing everything and then therefore you're pushing back. Uh, and then this gap is so big that literally the, the, the cell is like not, not physically touching the walls anymore. That's why we get a very small force. Uh, what is then interesting is that we can also now measure the cell speed. Right? How fast the cell is moving as a function of the gap size. Uh, so you can forget about these three straight lines here. This is just our controls and just look at this black line. Uh, so what we found is that there's actually an optimum gap size at which the cell moves the fastest. So if the gap is too small, the cell moves very slowly. Right? Similarly, if the gap is too big, the cell moves very slowly. So there's always an optimum. Uh, now in biology, uh, or in biological physics, uh, optimums are very interesting because it means that there's some selection mechanism or there's some possible selection mechanism going on. You know, and ultimately evolution might try to select this optimum you know, and then you know, chooses that path. So then we want to understand why, right? What, what gives rise to this, uh, to this optimum? Uh, and we think, uh, and this is essentially a video showing this. Right? So this is uh, uh, a cell in a, being squished in a very small gap. And there's a cell that is squished in a very fast, in an in a, in a intermediate gap at which is moving the fastest. So what we found is that uh, the cells in the small gap tends to show a lot more of these blebs, uh, which maybe makes sense because they're trying to you know, compress the cell a lot more. Right? So the cell has very high internal pressure that it's trying to release and therefore it forms many of these blebs. Right? So what we think is that there's now two competing mechanisms uh, that may explain this uh, optimum behavior. Uh, one is that when the cells become more confined, the intracellular pressure increases, uh, leading to the formation of many blebs. Uh, but these blebs are then also very uniformly spread out around the, the surface. Uh, and therefore, you know, there's therefore no net migration, right? Because the left cancels the right, the front cancels the back. Right? So we do, do this quantitatively. So the gray line here, so essentially we just do this experiment and then we just count the number of blebs. So this, this gray line shows that uh, the number of blebs increase as the, as, the, right, as the gap size decreases. Right? Uh, but then, now then I, in this black line, the circle symbols, we look at essentially the variation, right, the position, right? And, and essentially, uh, essentially the, in these small gaps, there's very low standard deviation in the position of these blebs. Right, which means that the blebs are very uniformly scattered around the cell, right? whereas the blebs tend to be more directional when the gaps are bigger. So we think that it is a combination of these two factors that, are, that gives rise to this optimum speed. Uh, now we actually then repeated, uh, use, use a computational simulation to, 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 to reproduce this process. So this is uh, essentially the same figure that I showed just now. I said that now we confine it between two walls Right. And we can actually reproduce uh, this optimum behavior computationally. Right. So in very small gaps, you get more blebs, but the blebs are essentially formed on the left and on the right, and therefore the cell does not translate right, because it has equal, it's been pushed in equal directions. Yeah, so then the question is, uh, the interesting question is, uh, can we shift this peak you know, or what governs this peak? So we so from from the simulations uh, from the computational modeling, uh, we show that uh, uh, or one of the parameters we tried that gives rise to this change 
in the position of this peak is essentially the cortex membrane adhesion energy. Right? So these are the, essentially the strength of these are adhesion springs that hold the membrane to the cortex. And we found that by, uh, by decreasing, decreasing this uh, adhesion springs, so basically decreasing the adhesion of the membrane to the cortex, uh, we can actually shift this peak uh, to, the, to the right. So we actually did an experiment where we essentially add a, add a drug, a pharmacological intervention, just basically a drug that we know uh, corresponds biologically to weakening this, uh, this protein that holds the membrane to the, to the cortex. Uh, it's actually known as an ERM protein like Ezrin. Uh, so we actually add this drug that inhibits this uh, adhesion, that, that these are uh, adhesion uh, proteins, and we found that indeed, uh, indeed, this uh, this gap, this peak now moves to the right. Uh, so this is an example of how you know having a correct physical model uh, you know, allows us to make predictions that we can then test experimentally. Because every time I go to a biologist, uh, I say, yeah, I can develop this model, I can develop this physics model. Then I say, yeah, yeah, what is it good for? Well, so this is an example of uh, how a physical model you know, can be used to make predictions that can then be tested and you know, validated experimentally. Yeah, so that's actually uh, all that I have to say. So let me just maybe summarize uh, uh, in the last few minutes of my talk. Let me just summarize the, you know, what I've discussed. Today, so uh, what I mentioned is that uh, you know very often we see cells are uh, moved by changing their their shape, uh, and we recognize that this this uh, happens you know from very ancient species to you know uh, all the way up to uh, you know humans and animal cells, uh, and we and this is especially important uh, in cancer metastasis. You know, where cells are you know, squeezed through the body to see the secondary tumor, right? And then therefore we take a physicist approach to try to understand, you know, this this problem by first developing a model for the blood size, the blood shape, and blood dynamics, right? So we have a computational model, and then we do some simple biophysical experiments to probe the cell speed and then show that there's this optimum speed uh, that the cells are, you know, used to migrate. So therefore, the summary picture is a little bit like this, uh, where you know, if you think of gap size as being small, intermediate, and large, right? if the gap size is too big, then the cell essentially cannot transfer momentum, right? cannot transfer momentum through the walls, and therefore there's no migration. Right? If the gap size is too small, the cell is essentially being squished such that it forms uh, it forms uh, these protrusions essentially rather uniformly around the circumference of the cell leading to no net migration. Right? So therefore, there has to be some intermediate gap size uh, that allows for the chimneying or the momentum transfer to happen that allows for the cell to, to migrate. So this is actually, uh, now in terms of uh, you know, thinking about what to do next, uh, uh, this is actually rather interesting because now we can ask the question of, uh, you know, can we introduce some drugs to cancer patients where we can change the gap size such that it's either too small or too big, such that now the cancer cell cannot migrate anymore. Right? And then the, therefore we would have a drug, a way to prevent cancer metastasis. Uh, so that's you know, maybe some, some, somewhere in the far future where we can think along, along these lines. Uh, because essentially we don't want the cells to be, we don't want the cancer cells to be migrating and we want it to be not migrating. Now, on the other hand, we can also, you know, for the neutrophils, the white blood cells. Right? So, so that's sort of the opposite case. In that case, you want the cells to move as quickly as possible to the site of injury. Right? You don't want it to like not be able to move to the site of injury. And right? so for these neutrophils, for these white blood cells, right, you want to optimize the speed. And then again, the question there is, uh, you know, can you therefore then change the, change the, you know, size of the, the, the gaps between the fibers in the body right, to optimize for, for you know, neutrophil migration. So, so you know, as a physicist, this is rather interesting. Uh, uh, 
because uh, essentially we have a more or less a unified model for of migration that you know is essentially applicable to you know both inflammation and cancer metastasis. Right? Uh, you know, in the, in one case you want things to migrate, in the other case you don't want the cancer cells to to migrate. Uh, and I think this is maybe a, an area where I think physics can be useful uh, because biologists who you know, study white blood cells, immunologists, they're immunologists, right? They don't really look at cancer cells, whereas cancer cell biologists are cancer cell biologists. They don't really uh, look at, uh, look at, you know, uh, immunology and, and neutrophils, right? So maybe this is an area where physics can be useful by trying to provide some universal uh, mechanisms, universal perspectives. Uh, so I've come to the end of my talk, uh, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, the previous group members, uh, Lim Fong Yin, Kun Yin Ling, and Bai Kia, who did uh, both the modeling and the simulations. And I'd like to uh, mention two collaborators, uh, uh, Maha at Harvard, whom I think some of you know, and uh, Paul Matsudaira at NUS, whom I think has uh, recently just retired. Uh, so most of the experiments uh, were done in collaboration with Paul, and the uh, modeling was done in collaboration with uh, Maha. So with that, uh, I thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take uh, any questions. So feel free to post your question. Maybe uh, I, I, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, <laughs> I have a question also, uh, um, uh, like you. So uh, maybe I missed something, but uh, so why are you characterizing this 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 movement by by a velocity, and not by um, a diffusion constant? Because it looks like it's it's it's, it's random, right? Okay, C can you can you describe this as uh, if there is no food? I mean, if there is no some some kind of gradient that 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 lead to some 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 kind of current or some kind of drag. I mean, if there's not such a thing, the, the movements look more like a random walk. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah you, 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 you're right. Uh, so if I, if I, for example, trace the, I don't have a slide to show this, uh, but I have a trajectory of, let's say, the center mass of this cell, and it, it, it actually looks like a, a random walk. So yes, I can, I can, I can, I can, I can look at the, I can calculate the mean square displacement, and I look at the diffusion coefficient. Uh, but in this case, uh, I'm I'm actually looking at the I mean I'm, I'm looking at the at the at the speed as in the 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 so so, so it's essentially a, a short term a, a short time essentially an instantaneous change in position. Uh, mm -hmm. If I were to look at the maybe migration over a longer distance, then I think diffusion would be the correct parameter to look at here. Uh, but in this case, uh, so the what we are interested in is the is the immediate response, you know, to this confinement. So I'm I'm looking more at the instantaneous response, uh, and that is why we chose to look at the to look at the, the, essentially the velocity. Uh, but we could uh, we could also look at the diffusion coefficient, or we could calculate the diffusion coefficient from the mean square displacement and, and look at it. But that will be over a longer time scale, uh, which is another problem that we can. We can look at, but for so I guess the answer is uh is that the the length scale and the time scale that we're interested in is rather short, and therefore we look at the instantaneous changes in position. Thank you. Can can we have a slide on uh, relating to uh, universality? I think there's a uh, power of alpha. I think uh, exponent of alpha. Maybe one of the slide where you have some equation. Uh, yeah, so so yeah. I think from the from the simulation, uh, the exponent we get is something like zero point eight or zero point seven. Uh, okay. I think from a back of the envelope calculation, it should be it should be inversely proportional. So it should be x goes like one over p. Uh, but from our simple model, we get something like point eight, point seven eight or something like that. Uh, so I, I I don't mean universality in the sense of uh, you know a critical phenomena, but Mm. But uh, but but it, it's on the order of uh, minus one just from scaling arguments. You see, but because uh, you mentioned that there are many uh, biological organisms that uh, uh, migrate or move by changing shape, so all these uh, different organisms do they exhibit the same alpha? 
So you, you do the measurement on many of them, or they, they may all different types. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 I I would love to do that calculation. Uh, I haven't done that calculation, and I don't think anybody has looked at that calculation. Mm. Uh, so that would be a nice uh project that we can assign to uh, potential FYP students. Okay. <laughs> to, to, if you have any good students, we can we can we can try to try to look at this. Uh, uh, yeah, we should we should do this. Uh. So so I should yeah. say that uh, it is actually not so easy to actually measure the pressure uh, directly in any experiment because the experiment is just, is just imaging. So mm -hmm. therefore, in any in any of this analysis, uh, the 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 pressure has to be inferred, you know, from some indirect method. Uh, so typically, we measure the pressure by looking at essentially the the, the flow velocity. Uh, mm -hmm. So that will only work if uh, the organism has a cytoplasm uh, that has a lot of these organelles that you can, or this basically has, with these fiducial markers that you can you can track, uh, and then from there you indirectly calculate the pressure based on the based on the flow rate. Uh, so that may or may not be easy to do. For some species, because for some species the cytoplasm can be either very transparent, or in which case you cannot visualize, or it can be too dense, and again you cannot visualize. So my guess as to why nobody has done this for many species is that uh, it is uh, simply the, the 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 imaging is not so straightforward to do. Mm. Uh, but we should uh, you know we should look we should comb through the literature and find all available species and then try to see whether there's any universal mechanism here or not. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good Thank suggestion. Mm. Feel free to ask questions. Uh... Hey, King Hei. Yeah, hey Hi, thanks for the help. It's very interesting. I actually have a few questions. So the first one is um, in your black model, right? So, um, if I look at the, uh, the, the screenshot of like cells that are moving, it looks a snapshot, let's say. The cell membrane looks very wrinkled. But then, you know, it seems that the mechanism, especially from the previous slide, is that, you know, if, it, if I imagine that actually there's a turgor pressure that's increasing, then, you know, normally when you think of something, if that turgor pressure is increasing, then the cell membrane is under pressure, right? So it will actually become stretched out, right? But in this case, it's wrinkled. So is it saying that, you know, um, it seems to be kind of contradictory, right? Do you have a good explanation? So this is the first question. And the second question is, I wonder, like you mentioned in your microscopic model or mechanical model, you need the spring between the inner plasma, plasma of the cell and the outer membrane to break, right? In order to move. But then, you know, it's kind of strange to me because is that a, a very critical thing? Because, you know, if the black is really big, then if the spring is broken, then why would it reform? And the third one is, um, have you looked at like the, the, the size of the blebs relative to the size of the cell, the number of it and try to correlate with the, with the speed? You know, is, is it like, you know, optimal size of the bleb relative to the velocity that in which it's moving? Yeah, yeah so these uh, are my questions. Yeah. Uh... So, so maybe if you talk about wrinkling, you're referring to this figure, figure here, right? Yes, you have one that has like the green edges, like uh, with the fluorescence, like yeah, yeah, this one, the red one, yeah, yeah. You know, it looked kind of wrinkled, right? Uh, this one, yeah. So, yeah. so, so I should say that uh, you know, so unfortunately, it is, you know, uh, very difficult or almost impossible to try to capture a, a cancer cell migrating. So all these are essentially. You know, essentially what we call transformed cells. So these are cells that has been artificially induced to be, you know, cancer, cancer like. So they are in some sense not real cancer cells. Uh. So uh, I think this is actually not a good example uh, because this is actually done, or this actually image through SEM. So there could be some you know, artifacts uh, that, that results in this in this wrinkling. Yeah. So this this example here where there's a lot of wrinkling uh, is actually they may be not a good example to show. So, so this this shows this forms many blebs are because this cell is already undergoing apoptosis. So the other the other scenario where where this blebs form is apoptosis. Uh, so apoptosis is when the cell is dying. 
Uh, so the cortex and everything is shrinking, and then you know, and I think the whole back, the membrane. That's why they form all these all these blebs. So, so I would, and then, but on the other hand, if you look at, let's say, uh, you know, a regular migrating cell like this, uh, like this bottom panel here, uh, then maybe you don't see this wrinkling that much. So I don't, I don't think this wrinkling uh, is a. Uh, you know, is a is a is a consequence of this uh, migration. It's just an artifact uh, in certain special cases. Uh, I forgot your second question. On the second question is regarding the breaking of the springs. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So 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 if, for example, in this case, uh, when uh, this is just a cartoon sketch, but if let's yeah. say this this bond is now broken, so so you're asking. It's hard to imagine, like between from three to four, for the bond to reef combine. So, to, so I didn't, I didn't go into the technical details. So, this cortex is primarily a ectomyosin, so it's an actin filaments. So, what we think is happening, and I think there are some papers that have actually shown this, is that the actin filaments depolymerize, and then the individual actin monomers then either diffuse or get evacted into this new area, and then once it gets into to this new space here, uh, it polymerizes again. So, so there is this, uh, you know, active uh, transport of the actin monomers inside that leads to this uh, repolymerization. So, people have actually, I think, image uh, uh, or attach uh, fluorescence to the actin and show that the actin monomers actually, you know, either diffuse or get evacuated into this new blab area. So, so this this reforming reformation of the cortex, uh, is is I think shown experimentally to be that mechanism. And then the third question is about the the relative size of the blebs and the cells, and you know, are they correlated to the speed at which the cell move? Mm. So. So we I we, we didn't do a very careful study of that. Uh, so for example, I can I can I can uh, you know, set some parameters such that you know in, in one case I get you know, very big blebs, in the other case I get very small blebs because of whatever you know, parameters that I that I choose and I can I can check the check the speed. Uh, uh, no, we didn't I didn't do that do that check, but that would actually be a, a straightforward simulation that we can again quickly quickly do. So, so I don't, I don't, I don't foresee there to be any, any, anything out of the blue in that, in that. Uh, if we were to do this study, but it's something that we should do that we just haven't, haven't done. Uh, but yeah, we could, we could, we could, and we should do that. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Yeah, we should get another FYP student to do this. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Any other question? From the from the group. Okay, if not, then I may, may I ask a last question. Yep. Yeah. So this this general question. So uh, uh, okay, you mentioned that uh, cancer cell mass uh, metastasis, right? So that tends to spread. I'm just wondering, is it what what's so special about cancer cell that make them tend to spread? That's other cell. Also tend to spread. Uh, if let's say cancer cell is so special that they are the one that tend to spread, so is it there's some special mechanism for them to move that make them special? Yeah. So this is something I am I'm wondering. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the, the question is uh, uh you know why why do cancer cells do this or, or do other cells uh, also do this or not? Uh, yeah. Yes. So unfortunately, I think that's a question that uh you know. That, so this is an outstanding question that I think many cancer biologists are, are, are still uh, you know, working very hard to, to try to understand. So I think the, the current consensus, uh, which may or may not be correct, I think nobody knows yet, is that uh, there's this process, what, what people call EMT, the, uh, the epithelium mesenchymal transition. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically the, the cells in the cancer state are what people call epithelial cells. Uh, and then when it, when it migrates, uh, you know, is what is called a mesenchymal state. So, so people postulate that uh, that uh, that cancer cells undergo this EMT, this epithelial to mesenchymal transition, uh, because you know some of the genes have been mutated that favors this uh, EMT 
uh, to take place. Whereas normal cells, you know, they, they don't have the, 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 the genes that, that uh, promote this EMT are not being are not, uh, are, are, are normal. Uh, so this is this is what people postulate. Then the question is, uh, you know, what is what are the genes responsible for EMT? And so mm -hmm. the TGF beta pathway. Then you know, there's currently a lot of drugs that try to target this 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 mm -hmm. this you know this TGF beta pathway, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you know, there's there's other there's also other people, other cancer biologists who who doesn't believe this to be the complete story. So the answer is uh so the answer to your question as to why cancer cells spread is uh, is still a million dollar question. It's not a million, it's a, it's a billion to trillion dollar question. Mm. Uh, and 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 people still do not know the answer completely yet. Okay. So th thank you. Can we think thank you very much for the great talk and also answering the other questions. Yeah, we learned a lot from from your presentation. Yeah, yeah David. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much for um, for this nice talk and. See you uh, all of you next week. We have another talk or so. Goodbye. Have a nice weekend. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you, Kevish. Yeah. See you on Monday. Yeah. Oh yeah, Monday. Thank you. Thank you. See you on Monday. Yes. Yeah. Physically, <laughs> right? Yeah, physically. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, David. Bye bye.